Tick, 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 tick. You remember a time when you used to steal aching glances at the clock, praying for the strike of the merciful hour that finally set you free? Temporarily released from the shackles of your tiresome workday, you would eagerly rush home, shed your work clothes like a burdensome second skin, and flit off into the night to join friends for merriment and mischief. Those days are gone. The shift came on slowly at first. Sharp pains, dizziness, relentlessness, insomnia. But even more unsettling changes tightened the grip within you. It became clear something was very wrong. Poked, prodded, examined, analysed, a battery of tests, a gauntlet of medical pummeling and anxious uncertainty. And then, the waiting. When the call finally came, you already knew the answer before the words rolled off the lips rasping on the other end of the line. Lost in an echo chamber, your mind passed only snippets of the doctor's news, the one that stung the most. It's terminal. A year left to live. Maybe two, at best. I'm so... so sorry. And then, you're alone. Now time is your enemy, siphoning away the last of you with every passing moment, draining the light, the colour from your world. Leaving an empty shell of aching, hopelessness and dark anticipation in its wake. The clacking of keyboards, ringing of phones and casual banter of clueless co-workers. This steady ache. It rakes in the frayed corners, pulls at the tattered edges of your weary mind. But the appointed hour has arrived. It dampens the din. If only for a short while, tomorrow is another day. For them, at least. For you? Possibly. You linger just a little minute longer, letting the eager parade filter through the exit. The last to leave, you close up, lock the door and pull your overcoat tight around you. A splitting mist turns into downpour, well before you reach the dry sanctuary of the putrid subway entrance. The stairs are a descent into unpleasant smells and hustled near misses. As bustling crowds crush together to get to and from their mundane nine-to-fives, for a moment you miss that simplicity of routine, the promise of continuance. Standing at the edge of the platform, you look down at the electrified tracks. Wind picks up in the tunnel, tickling the rapidly approaching train. Your mind wanders. Imagine what it would be like to be caught on the tracks right as the train comes, barreling through at 60 miles per hour. Death is a beacon, drawing you even closer. It swirls and dances on the sparking steel girders below. It teases and taunts, only inches away. Come to me, whispers the siren calls. It's not yet time. You take a few steps back from the yellow line. Twenty minutes feels like an eternity in the packed subway car. Damp, sweaty, exhaustion and regret. Mixed with promise and delusion. A wagon full of cattle. Obvious turned out numb. Stop by stop, the opening and closing of the door fins the herd. It's a welcome cullen, a shift in your space, a losing of nuts. Soon you'll last and you can breathe easily again, but you still scan the car with a quick glance out of habit, one last time to make sure you're really, truly alone. Except you're not quite alone. There's a small leather satchel sitting on an empty seat in the far corner of the car. You glance around again, not trusting your wary eyes. There's still not a living soul, save your own. The handrail is sticky with grime from the clutches of a thousand dirty fingers. Filthy. You wince at its touch, but it offers stability as you work your way to the other end of the car, towards the orphaned satchel. Where did its owner go? The bag is withered and worn. Some tired soul will no doubt be missing its contents, you gather. A high-pitched whine pierces the air as the car rocks and rattles. The lights flicker. 32nd Street, it's your stop. Time to go. Do you take the bag, or do you leave the bag? We're going to take the bag. You insignificantly reach out and swipe the bag, frugaring it's better off in your hands than left to wander in the dark tunnels inside a giant metal beast alone. Thick 
The stale underground air turns cool and damp as you emerge from the city's high-speed intestines and hits the noisy streets above. 340 steps later, you're at the door of your second-story apartment. Fumbling for the keys, muttering under your breath, the lock finally gives way. Peeling off your soaked coat, you drop everything on the table, kick off your shoes, and check your answering machine. You have no new messages, no surprise there. Ignoring the pile of unwashed dishes and the empty fridge, you slide back to the table and remember the bag. Inside the bag, you find an old book. The book is aged and weathered. Its cover is adorned with ominous skeletal beings that look half human, half serpent and the title is written in a language you don't have the tongue to decipher. So open the book. Unlocking the old book, you open the cover, flip through the dusty pages. The book appears to be blank. How odd! Let's flip to the first page. The frail pages seem brittle to the touch, as if they're in danger of crumbling to, into nothingness, yet your fingers resonate with an unknown energy. Flip to the last page. You turn to the last page. Nothing. Let's go to a random page. You flip to a random page and find nothing. Are your eyes playing tricks on you? Or did you see the faint glimmer of words fading from view just now? Go for another random page. Flipping through the page, a faint flicker of ink catches your eye. You flip back several pages to try and find it. After much searching, you uncover a page that spots a faint drawing of a keyhole, sketched in pencil. You intensively reach out a finger and trace it over the drawing. A sudden sharp pain, a paper cut, spurs you to pull your hand away quickly. Looking down, you notice the keyhole sketch has changed into a feigned serpent. Spots of your blood dot the page. The room swims. You feel faint and disorientated. Your vision goes blank as you hit the floor. A sharp impact slams your temple jolting your synapses with electrifying force. It sends a raw, white heat burning through your consciousness. Then, empty space. You fall through the black void, erasing the past, erasing the future, only the present. What is happening? Where am I? Who am I? What is this darkness eaten away inside me? And then... A light. You awaken in a small chamber, illuminated by the light of a single flickering torch, resting as going at the far wall. A sharp Throb pulsing behind your eyes fade quickly, but an unpleasant chill is creeping in. You, no you notice words scratched into the stone floor. At this distance, the torchlight is too dim to make out what they say. You grab the torch from the wall sconce and take comfort in the subtle warmth it breathes across your face. You can now get a better look at your surroundings. Holding the torch closer to the floor, you can clearly see the inscription carved there, it reads, Chapter 1. Why the Walls Bleed. A heavy wooden door to the south appears to be the only way in or out of this pit. The door creaks and shudders open as you strain against its weight. You find yourself in a larger stone room that's cavernous and empty. The echoing sound of water droplets come from a passage to the west. You catch a whiff of something familiar, something out of place. Is that citrus? You also notice another passageway to the east. Okay, let's go west, as that leads to a dead end. The narrow corridor opens into a dead end room that reeks of overripe fruit. You're blazed with a sweet, pungent odour, which nearly overpowers you. Looking around, you notice a vicious reddish substance draining out of several large, round holes in the wall. This mysterious fluid drips down in a slow, syrupy cascade, collecting in a stone basin carved along the base of the wall. The 
the only exit is through the passage you came in to the east. Let's look at this reddish substance. substance. The sweet odour is emanating from this odd liquid. You decide to leave it alone for now. Exit through the passageway to the east. Pushing further into the unknown depths, your eyes play tricks on the torchlight. What lurks in the darkness ahead, skittering away just beyond the glow of the torch. As you round the corner, you notice a small alcove in the passageway here. The corridor continues to the east. The northern passageway leads around the corner back to the west. Let's investigate this little alcove. It's a large crack in the wall of the alcove. It's not big enough for you to squeeze through. Who knows what could be in there? Let's reach into the hole. You reach into the hole and immediately recoil as teeming mass of stinging and biting insects swarm up your arm. It takes a minute to fl fling them off. Let's go back, that wasn't a good idea. Let's continue going east. The passage extends to the west and the north. Let's go north. A pile of bones and skulls lay scattered across a large stone slab in the centre of the cha this chamber. Along the far wall, a series of sharp hooks dangle from the ceiling by chains. It's clear that much suffering befell the poor souls who met their fate in this place. Smears of their dry blood are now darkened with time and decay, paint a macabre scent. A passageway extends to the west. A southern door opens into a long hallway. Eh. Well, let's continue west then. The floor has collapsed in the hallway ahead, which is flooded with stagnant, murky water. On the opposite side lies an ornate door. You peer into the depths and wonder what might lie waiting just beneath the shimmering surface. Chunks of rubble are crumbling off the side of the wall by the edge of the walkway. Let's investigate the rubble. You pick up the first sized chunk of rubble and hurl it into the water. It splashes, then sinks. The water surface comes splashing to life as something makes quick work of the rubble. You quickly skirt around the edge of the watery corridor while the unknown beast is distracted. Behind the ornate door, you enter a nicer room. The stone is more chiselled and refined. Red tapestries hang on the wall and the decor is comforting upgrade from the dank crumbling corridors you just crawled out of. Four tall display cases are positioned around the fancy chamber. At a cursory glance, the tower and display case appears to be filled with a greenish fluid. There's also something else inside them too. Investigate display case one. Preserved within the green fluid is a desecrated corpse that looks like it might once have been human. It's missing both arms. The body's one remaining leg is tethered by a chain latched to the base of the display. The mouth has been crudely sewn shut and a cluster of worm-like creatures are floating out from the gaps in the stitching. Display case 2. You find a wolf-like creature hanging upside down in the green fluid. His poorly stitched stomach cavity has burst open inside the display, with ropes of long stringy worms floating out of it alongside its entrails. Looking more closely at the gruesome display, you notice the creature's eye twitch and blink. Display case 3. Two severed human torsos have been stitched together in a gory mirror image at the waist. Ropey clusters of worms are spilling out from the seam. Display case 4. This one is empty, drained of its fluid and lacking a grisly compassion within. You also see a stairway leading to a door in the north, a small closet door to the east, and a passage lies to the south. Let's investigate the small closet door to the east. The door is locked. Let's not. Let's go north. <laughs> you walk up the small stairs, open the door, and enter a citizen chamber. The clanking of chains draw you further into the room. Bound to the throne, resting at the far wall of the chamber, you find a creature with the body of a man and the head of a bird. It looks off into the distance, unblinking. There's also a large door to the west and the door you entered in to the south. What is this weird creature? As you step closer, the creature speaks with a slow, raspy cadence. Ah, I feel a presence. What is this? 
Why do I sound so French? I just insulted a bunch of French people. <laughs> Why do I have such a weird voice? <laughs> what is it? What is it? Oh, what could it want with me? Little me shackled away in these filthy metal irons. Filthy little irons to hold my flesh and bone. It is a strange thing indeed. So very strange, fleshy it is. It reeks of other world, doesn't it? Little me wonders why it stands there, poised with some unknown purpose. The thump, thump, thump of its heart beats a hair faster now, doesn't it? Like the tap, tap, tap of ticking time. What manner of fluid flows beneath its skin wonders little me. Ah, it breathed, it teenaged with wicked curiosity. What, oh what could it want with little me then? Does it seek to put the sharpness into my flesh and spill the essence onto the floor? Does it take my shiny? Does it feed me the delicious sweet nectar I crave, I miss so dearly? Or perhaps it has something else in mind for little me. Feed it the delicious sweet nectar? Treacherous it tease little me with its lies. Poor little me with no sweet nectar to drink. It returns when it has something sweet for me. The bird creature continues to mutter to itself. Investigate the large door to the west or leave to the south. Investigate the large door to the west. The heavy door is decorated with scratched marks and dried blood stains. It's locked. Talk to the bird creature again. Or perhaps it has something else in mind. Little me. What could it possibly want with little me? We could just free the bird creature. Let's try to do that. You reach out to test the strength of its chains and the creature gets anxious. Eh, it wishes to set me free? Oh yes, yes, that's it, very good. It's only gone very British. What will you do you use to break the chains? What will you use to break the chains? Your hands? No. Despite your best effort, your bare hands and brute strength are not enough to rend the rusted chains and free the creature. You need something stronger. You search around for something big enough to smash chains. Nothing yet. We'll search more. You search around for something big enough to search more. Behind the throne, you find a dislodged piece of stone that might be big enough. Let's try the large rock. You heft the large stone and smash the chains until it finally snaps. A sudden flurry of excitement washes over the creature. It frees little me. What a delight. Then it looks up at you and cooks and cocks its head at an odd angle, rising up. Even hunched over, the creature is much taller than it first seemed. It looked down at its hands, and it flexes each taloned finger. It will make such a pretty addition. Before you can react, the creature is upon you with a lightning speed, hungrily tearing its back into your flesh. I think that was a bad idea to set him free. You've perished in one of the many horrible ways. Try again and seek to change your fate. The end.